Well, thank you very much, John. Well, I'm the strange duck in the pond, so to say. Just to start, I'm. I want to to express that I'm not a uh, haven't got a background of any technical uh, things like lofting or anything. I'm not a professional carpenter. I'm just a an amateur uh, that wanted to have a, a, a boat made. So um, I wanted to show you first where I came from, and. Uh, to show a little of my background, this picture here is the, the first picture of me on a, on a boat. I was three years of age and it was the first vessel that um, my, my father bought in the 1950s somewhere. And um, from there I started sailing like this was the first boat that my father bought. It is an, a traditional fishing boat from the old Zuiderzee and um, my father bought it because the, um, the family, we, I'm, I'm the youngest of a family of, uh, of eight kids, and um, um, they had a background of, uh, of, of scouting. So I, I, I think they wanted to have the, the troop together. Um, but basically I think it, it was the cheapest way for them to have a, a holiday. Um, when all the kids were out of the big city, there, there couldn't be too much problems. Uh, made by the kids and the only extra expense they had when we were on the water was extra food because we were always hungry and um, in my imagination we had this boat for many years but when I calculated it back it's only been in the family for four years before my father bought his first his second boat um, I think they they um, they wanted to uh, to have a, a family cottage. My my mother was a, a school teacher, and we went on holidays as soon as the schools went out. And um, my father had to keep on working in as a civil servant in in Amsterdam. Um, so the the idea was we put the boat somewhere uh, in the water, and the family is on board having fun. And in the weekend, my father came on board and we started sailing. But after um, I think the first year, um, my eldest brother here, I think he was 17, 16, 17. And they, decide, they decided that they could take over the boat and sail throughout the week. So um, basically it was a family affair. And you see me here on the, on the wheel, on the supervision of my eldest brother, um, the eldest and the youngest. This was an extraordinary picture because mostly this was my place in the dinghy tone behind and just watching that nothing got jammed when we entered the lock or, or past the bridge or anything. So um, I think that um, for me, sailing in traditional boats was from really the start um, a natural thing. Um, after this boat has been in the family for four or five years. My father bought another boat, which was decommissioned from uh, Carco, and he transferred this barge. It's a 20 meter chalk. Um, he bought this. I, I, I went up there when he bought us out of commission. It was an empty hull, and he transferred this barge into this yacht, which is not. Uh, traditional at all because they they ought to be uh, single masted and he transferred it to the sketch uh, because he thought being a romantic guy it's more impressive to have a, a, a catch uh, rigged yacht um, but only now that I prepared this this stock I realized and I, I, I want to give a tribute to my father because he has been working on this boat, transferring it from an, an empty hull into this yard, in my opinion, only with one uh, electric table saw and uh, one electric drill, and all the rest was done by hand. And he did it next to his professional job, full-time job as a civil servant. So it was evenings and weekends. So I can't imagine that he, he achieved something like this uh, working on my own on, on these boats with all my tools and all my space and all my extra time. So 
I all I I I wondered also how he could afford this with a big family and and only the wage of a civil servant. Well, the trick that he did, he he wrote everything down that he that he uh, fixed, and doing that, he wrote books about it. So basically, this is a book written by my father about building a boat and transferring ships into a yacht. And I think this is one of the main sources of income that financed this whole project. The problem was that after um, a couple of years, I, th I think about 10 years, the family grew out of the boat, not because the boat was not big enough, but my elderly brothers had raised their own families and didn't want to, to sail anymore with the family. So um, the boat was not in use anymore. So I started as the youngest, I had plenty of time. So I started chartering this barge with, um, with people mainly from Germany for weeks and weekends. And that's where I learned sailing, not on the small boats, not on, on, on any uh, a course or whatever. I just, my father handed over the boat and said, well, you can fix it. My father lost interest in boating. And I think um, in the end, he was not interested in boating so much as much as in building. And starting the project uh, on my own, I, I often wondered what was my favorite, my biggest pleasure, building a Galway hooker or sailing it. And, and I'm still puzzling about this. Anyway, that's where I started in Holland. And after my father um, sold the boat, my older elder brothers had traditional uh, Dutch uh, craft sailing as yachts. And the picture here shows you that the traditional Dutch working boat has got a round bottom or a flat bottom, but they're all shallow. And that's necessary for the shallow waters we have got, the inland waters, and they've got leeboards. So they are not, they are not really fit to sail out in the open. They are not going out in the North Sea unless they are very big. Um, but they've got a, a plenty of room inside. So the choice for me was uh, because the, the, the water in Holland got, got crowded, more crowded, I wanted to have a boat that was capable of sailing out in the open. Now, Dutch traditional craft is not fit for that. So I was looking out for a different craft. And the first option was the Essex Smack from um, the England uh, East Coast, Blackwater area. But in my opinion, they were either too big to sail shorthanded, one, two, or three persons, or um, they were too small to have a proper inside uh, living. Uh, area. So then um, my a friend of mine um, traveled over to uh, Ireland and came back with a, the book you all know from Dick Scott. And um, I think that um, um, uh, convinced me that I wanted to have something like a Galway hooker. And the thing that convinced me was this picture. I was convinced by this picture of the Lord uh, having some breeze, uh, probably uh, somewhere in Galway Bay. And I thought, well, if this is an open boat and it is capable of having this kind of weather, then it has to be seaworthy enough. Um, so that was the choice I made. And um, it, it was not a, a, a choice from, from, uh, from the mind, but it's somewhere I thought, I want to have this boat and I didn't have the money. Well, the fact was that at that time I was working with a friend of mine who, who is a ship's carpenter and I was restoring his wooden bottle in the yard. He had to be replanked and we were discussing and I said, I want to have this hull made in, in steel because, well, Dutch boats are built in steel. And um, he had been building a wooden boat and he had we were restoring his second boat. And then he said, well, if you build this boat in in traditional in wood, it costs you, I mean, the whole boat will cost you about the same amount as 
the, the steel hull will do on its own. And I said, well, I don't think I can manage. And he said, well, if you get stuck somewhere, I will help you out. And later on, I will show you where he helped me out. So basically the choice for the, for the um, uh, Goldway Hooker was done by the fact that I wanted to have seaworthy craft and I want to have a traditional uh, boat. So there it began. And then I had to find a way to, to, to get the, the details. So by the book of Dick Scott, I got uh, um, a correspondence, a set of a correspondence with Porrick McLaughlin, who is down there from the Nave Margin. And the Nave Margin was built on the lines of the True Light. And the, the drawings are in the back of that book. So it was a, a logic choice for me to, to address to him. And the, the boat fitted my size and especially the draft because I wanted to be able to, set, to sail on the shallow waters here um, in the north as well. So it was the perfect boat for me. And um, I made an arrangement with him to travel to, to Kinvara, uh, Kinvara weekend in 1990. And, um, and we, he said, well, just come up and you can sail throughout the weekend with me. So being Dutch, my brother and myself, we, we traveled up down to Kinvara, took the, uh, from Dublin, took the train to Galway and, and uh, the bus to Kinvara. And if you have got an event like this in Holland, the boats uh, show up on, uh, in the harbor probably two weeks in advance with at least a week in advance. And when we came up to Kinfara, we didn't see any boat in the harbor at all. And I remember it was a Friday, it was drizzling, it was, it was wet, and um, there was nothing to do for us. So we, 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 we walked around and um, we were puzzled where the boats would be. And then on the Saturday, it cleared up a bit and we rented these bikes and we drove out to, to see where the hell will these boats be. And I, I remember the top, right picture was the first picture I had of actual picture of the Galway hookers and they were so distinct with the rigging uh, sailing up from from Galway Bay into Kinfara. Um, so there my my heart jumped and then the the harbor filled up and I I remember that the, the couple I had a picture of, of the couple here with uh, Johnny Bailey because um, I said to my brother there's one of them hookers on fire I remember that the flames came out of the uh, of the hatch of the forecastle because he was um, uh, heating up his fire just to uh, 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 it's an open fire in the forecastle to to heat up the, the stuff and I really thought it's in fire so that was my first impression of of the boats when they were in the harbor with all the people around was was great uh, event for us but on the Sunday it turned out that Park McLaughlin had his whole family on, on, on the boat. So there was no room for us at all to sail with him. So we stayed on the pier and that was, that was for the best because it, the race in 1990 was spectacular because it was a, 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 a up-piping wind. Um, I remember these two Pukans in, in, in the top, they had to reef down before the race. And, um, um, and it took a long time before they, they could they could reef her down. And um, we were so puzzled which what kind of race there was. We, we didn't have any clue about classes, about anything. We just just saw boats sailing out, coming back again, turning, and it was a spectacular race that I remember. So we got a lot of pictures um, about about. Uh, the boats and we had a lot of impressions but the problem was afterwards we didn't have any details of uh, of the boats whatsoever but what we, what I had is with this talk of Pork McLaughlin he gave me the phone number of Joe Murphy in Dublin so on the Monday we, we traveled back to Dublin and I gave Joe Murphy a call and I explained who I was, what I wanted. And he said, well, if you're interested, we can make an appointment for somewhere one evening this week. And I said, well, I'm sorry, I'm flying back on, on Tuesday morning. So um, I'm quite uh, uh, in, in, in need of time. 
So he said, well, then you come this evening. So I, I went up to his place and uh, we had a, a lovely evening, a, a, a chat about how he uh, got the lines of the true light. And I don't know if, if, if you all know Joe Murphy, He's, he was a really polite uh, a guy. And um, he told me a story that um, he took the lines of the, um, uh, uh, of the boat somewhere, I think it was in Baltimore, the boat was there and at low tide they could walk around. And the two of them uh, were just walking around and Joe took notes of all the measurements he, he made. And uh, he had small papers that he put in his pocket and then he transferred them into a booklet. And, uh, and in that way, he got a shape of this boat. But he told me then uh, a guy showed up on the bay and, uh, and he asked him what, he addressed him and asked him, what, what are you doing? And he said, well, we want to have the lines of the true light because it's a famous boat. It survived the Glacken disaster and, and we want to rebuild it. And I don't know who the owner was at that time, but he just said, well, I don't want you to have the lines of my boat. Once it's gone, it has to be gone. And I don't want to have a copy of it sailing around. And Joe tell, told me that he had two big dogs next to him. And he, he took the booklet out of his hand and he tore it apart and threw it in the water. And he said, I was so afraid, not of the men, but of the dogs, that I didn't dare to go back again to, to get the lines. So he was uh, disillusioned and, and came back home. And uh, he was sitting in the kitchen and then he saw the kitchen floor with all the black and white uh, blocks of the, of the floors. And he said, well, this is a perfect grid. And he had all these small notes in his pocket that he pulled out. And on this kitchen floor for, for a week, he tried to, to get all the lines of the, of, of the true light back. So he, he gladly handed over a set of drawings to me, but he said, I don't know which are the, the proper ones. I said, he said, I can't remember from which drawings I made the Nave Margin from for, for, for Loughlin. So he said, <clears throat> if you have these, these uh, drawings, uh, make a half model. <clears throat> Sorry. And, um, and that's what I did. I made first this half model and uh, um, just by <clears throat> putting more putty on it, I made fair lines just by sanding it down and, and um, with the hands I could feel what the proper lines were. And then I sent it, I, I took drawings from that. Well, as I said earlier, I'm, I'm not a technical guy, so I can't do any lofting or whatever. So what I did, I put all the lines on it. Um, and um, here on, on the squares, I, I saw in, I made a saw cut and I put cardboards in it and took the lines over and put them on the paper again. And from that, I, I made drawings that I sent it back to Joe and then Joe commented it and I, I changed it around again. So I think the, the whole process of this took me half a year before I had a proper set of lines. And this is a, a, a one to 10 scale uh, half model of the, of the, uh, the Moorhead. So that was the beginning. And then I had to find a place to, to build it. So this is uh, the garden in the back of my house in those days. And what you can't see, but here in the, in the back is a ditch. And on the other side, we had a, a small island in the polder. And I went to the, to the mayor of our village and I said, well, I'd, I'd like to build a shed to build a boat. Well, happily, this mayor was fond of sailing himself. So he said, well, this is a natural reserve area you're talking about. So you're not allowed to, to build anything down there. And he said, I hope that you would ask me permission to build in the back garden. And I said, well, I don't know if my wife will agree with that. Well, he said, just fix it there. So I went home and I said to my wife, well, I want to have a shed in the garden. You have to give up your garden for, for that area. And um, after 15 minutes, she realized that it was either uh, me having another side to build a boat and, and not seeing me at all, or give up the garden for five years, which she 
eventually gladly did. And I built this, this uh, Nissan hut, uh, uh, Romney hut, uh, just connected to my workshop. So that was ideal. The only problem was that I started building with epoxy. Now, if you work with epoxy, you're probably familiar with that. The, the, the biggest problem is moisture and temperature. So I had to insulate the, the, the hut. You can see it later on better, but this is co completely insulated. And the other thing is that I had here a, a, a beam for the, for the keel, which was leveled. And underneath, um, there was moisture coming from, from the garden soil. So this is insulation on the floor, the, the orange thing. And um, from there on, I built it up. And it turned out it was really good uh, atmosphere to, to, to build in epoxy. I, I had heating, I had everything there. And this is the, the start with laying the keel. You can see that it's laminated at, um, in long uh, uh, beams that I inherited from my father. Um, so that was something from the family as well. And then I had to collect my, my stock of wood. Well, this is the hut. So that's all oak that I used because I started with the idea of laminating the frames as well. Um, so that was the, the stock of, of oak. And then later on, I realized that uh, the frames in, in um, uh, laminated frames were too time consuming and hard to, to fix. And I found out that there was, um, um, uh, what do you call it, um, uh, storage of traditional timber in, uh, in Holland for the traditional bottles. And the bottles have got frames that are almost twice as, as thick as the ones I needed for the hooker. So I, when I got there, I could get, this is all oak uh, grown timber. And this is the size of a, of a main beam from a, from a butter. But this were some somehow leftovers in the yard, so I could I could get that fairly cheap. And the first trip I I got there with my minivan filled with oak, and um, when I got back I blinded all my opponents on the, on the road, so I realized that I'd better uh, uh, borrow a, a trailer to get them there. And then for. Um, um, for the stringers and all, I've, I had this, this is an oak tree I got from the wood and that's uh, seasoned on, on just on air uh, in the yard of a friend. And this is the timber for the skin, which is uh, not large because um, I thought the, um, the, the, the large has too much wood sap. I don't know if that's a proper word, but um, um, it's not as dry as um, as um, uh, what do you call it? Um, mm, uh, it's not large, but it's pitch pine uh, because the epoxy has to really get into the fibers of the grain. And if there's if there's large sapwood, then the, it can't be filled with epoxy. So this is another friend I. Um, I stored all this wood to dry out because for working with epoxy, you need a, 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 a 16 to 80% moisture grade of the wood. So that takes time. So I've got plenty of time for preparing the boat. Now, when I started building the boat, I had made myself some sort of a promise that had to be ended as well, somewhere in four to five years. So I estimated I've got three stages. The first stage is uh, building the, the framework, keel, stem, stern, and frames. The second uh, stage was planking her in, and the third stage was fish finishing her off. And I reckoned between one or two years for each stage. Um, so I had plenty of time to dry the wood before uh, working on, on, uh, on the planks. And this was already dried um, in the yard from, from, uh, from the stock. So here I started with, you can see the, the, 
the stem is laminated as well. The keel is laminated, but the breast hook is solid oak. And the same goes for the stern. The stern post is laminated, but the breast hooks are, are solid. Um, and then I have to uh, introduce the guy down here. He was our, I'm a physical therapist and he was our uh, retired GP. And uh, he's, he was, he's, he died unfortunately of age, um, but he was fond of, uh, of boating as well. And uh, the funny thing, what I realized, what I experienced when I was building the boat is that people think it's such a idiot idea to build a boat that they are all getting interested and they all um, want to support you somehow much more than I experienced when I was building the house or the shed. That's fairly normal, but building a boat, everyone was curious how I could uh, manage that. And, um, and this fellow, I asked him on a, on, a, on a Wednesday when we went out for dinner somewhere, some party, I said, um, I, I took to build it, I took the Thursday and the Saturday off from work. And um, on a Wednesday, I said to him, can you help me tomorrow? Because I want to set the, 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 uh, the stem post and I need an extra hand. And he said, well, after laying the keel, I realized that I want to take part in this project. And he helped me out for the whole, the whole project, four and a half, five years. And the only restriction he had, he said, I have made so many responsible uh, uh, decisions in my life as a GP. I want to help you, but I don't want to have any responsibility. I only do whatever you say. I am the second hand, and that's the end of the story, which is great if you have got a guy like that. And he had an eye for boating as well, so he was really helpful. Um, now, here you can see my, my first setup. Uh, there are uh, steel uh, rails on the, on the wall, and I made outriggers that I couldn't uh, put in, in, in different heights. So the idea was I, I bent, I laminate the frames in the form I need. And then I had a heating, electrical heating down there. I closed down the box and I, I uh, after a day, they're all fixed and I've got my laminated frames. But the problem was that it's, it, it was too fragile to have a solid form. So when the, 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 the frames came out, I had to remodel them after all. So that's where I abandoned the idea of, uh, of laminated frames. Um, and in reality, from this project, the, the five main uh, uh, stations are laminated and, and really solid like that. And everything, uh, the, the two in between that I have to fill up uh, were uh, grown timber. So that was the first part. And then I had to, to set the main frames and um, I realized how, how many mistakes you can make by setting up a frame that can be uh, uh, wrong in three dimensions. And I was embarrassed after really, I think some weeks that I realized that I should have uh, used, um, what do you call it, the hose level, is that, is that the right um, phrase, which was mentioned in the book of my father. But being a son, I thought, well, I know what the old man has to say. I don't read the book. So I, I really forgot about this, this tool, which is, uh, I think, without saying in this stage, the most important measurement tool that you've got to set the frames at the right level. So it took us a couple of weeks to get it fixed. And every time that we changed something here, it, it, it made uh, alterations elsewhere. So it was a disaster, but after, after a while, it, it turned out to be properly done. And here you can see all the frames set and I lined them out with battens. And um, well, here you can see, whoops, where is he? These are laminated frames. This is a solid one. This is a solid one. 
and this is the top frame that is solid. Now, the way I took the lines of these frames, I put a piece of, of garboard, hardboard, um, and I made notches, took notches out of them, which I shove over the, the battens. I took the line there, and you can see it fixed here, shifting over the, uh, the battens. I took the lines, I transferred it to the uh, grown timber, and that's the way I, I got my, my frames. And then I only had to, to have the right baffle in it. Was time consuming, but we managed to, to, uh, to fix this in, in a year and a half. So we, I thought we were, we were on schedule. And in between, we had different uh, tasks to make. Um, we arranged a group of um, people that had got some special um, influences. This is a guy, uh, he's a yard master from Amsterdam. So I borrowed a lot of tools, especially clamps. This is the guy, the journalist that gave me the book of Dick Scott. This is my, uh, my second hand hang. So we had a dinner every year to, to survey what, what we had achieved. Um, we had several parties uh, in between when we thought, well, it's time to have some relaxing time and we have to celebrate the next stage. Um, I made a, oops, sorry. I made a, an ornament on the shed, which is originally um, in, in Holland, every old house has got um, a, a, an ornament like this, but mostly it's some sort of circle or, or whatever there. So I, I scarfed a, a Galway hooker. And um, later we sold this house. And every time I, I drive by, I can see that this hooker is still there. I don't know if the people that are living there realize what it is, but at least it's still there. Um, and the middle picture, uh, that, that was another disaster because in the beginning you saw this, this load of oak in the back of the shed. And it, it turned out that, um, oh, now I have to, to find out what it uh, uh, is. Is it a, a, the longhorn beetle? That's the, the beetle that is uh, eating the oak. And it turned out that it was in the, it, it, we had a lot of these uh, animals in, in the wood. And I remember sitting on, on the pile of oak and I could hear them underneath my, <laughs> my <laughs> underneath my, I, I, I could hear them eating my oak like I was sitting on a bag of crisps. It was a disaster. So we had to spray the whole thing. And this is what you see here in the middle. In some, some, some uh, sunny day, we had this mask on and we sprayed all the oak. We took all the sap wood out. And, um, and afterwards, we had no problems uh, about from this beetle anymore. But that was, for me, it was scaring that I can remember. So there were things in between that, that keep, kept us going. But here you can see uh, the top left the the picture of all the frames and the floors everything nicely lined out uh on underneath there you can see the the belting which is from oak and not from from large um it's uh, laminated laminated in two strakes um just to give it extra strength um and then you can see on this picture how we uh, I took the lines for the next planking, uh, transferring it here on um, on the on the planks and 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 sawing it out. Uh, well, it turned out that it was not, for me it was not not that hard to to figure out how that has to be done. It's all only time consuming, but it it showed its own. Now the garboard is made of oak because I I thought well. If I made this of oak, it's the widest plank from, from the whole hill. So I thought it, um, if I made it from oak, I've got more strength in, in, the, in the backbone of the, of the ship. But the problem from oak is that you have to shape it. All the other uh, strakes you could just uh, put on and, uh, and they are bent naturally, but the garboard had to be um, uh, put in shape. So, I had to burn it, and that was an experience on its own. It was nice to do. Um, it had to be twisted. You can see that around 
Here it had to be twisted just about 45 degrees in the stern and in the bow. And, um, and of course, I'm not a carpenter, as I said earlier. So the epoxy is, 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 um, is a great stuff because uh, it, it fills up. You can see here on, on the strakes there, it, all the seams are not, um, um, oh, what's the phrase again in England? Uh, not corked but it's just uh, with epoxy glued together. So the, 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 the connection is really solid and it's watertight from one strake to another. And here, um, again, I don't have to, to cork it to get it watertight, it's just fixed with epoxy. I think in total, there's about 50 kilos of epoxy spent on this, uh, on this whole project. Now, uh, here in the top, you can see the huge clamp that I, I, I borrowed from, from the yard to get this oak piece in, in place. Um, so again, you, you need a lot of friends with, with material, but somehow it showed that they, they came up to me instead that I had to, to find them. Now, the second stage ended by closing the planks. I planked it down from top down and from bottom up. So the middle plank was, um, was the last piece that we had to, to, uh, to close down. So that was time for the party again. And the parties were mostly uh, accompanied by, uh, by, by songs and parties. So that was great. And then after that, I uh, wanted to have her epoxy coated. So the whole hull is covered with epoxy cloth. Um, which is simply uh, uh, you you put the the epoxy on the on the hull and like wallpaper the cloth is is stuck and once it's on the boat you have to to roll it in and the problem is here on the on the the, the garboard and the keel these corners are hard to to cover to to fill up with epoxy because afterwards you have to roll epoxy into the epoxy and, and it's only ready when you don't see the cloth anymore. I don't know if, if, if you all have been working with this, but it's amazing how it, how it really uh, works. The problem is that after uh, curing of the epoxy, there are air balloons strapped underneath the cloth. So you, you, for the whole evening, we were, running around with rollers to, to get the air out of the, uh, of the system. But um, uh, what else? Oh yeah, the, the, the problem with epoxy is that um, you can be allergic for it. And I'm a physical therapist, so I was really concerned about my hands. This guy, he is the, the salesman. He, he had a yard only dealing with epoxy. And obviously he had no problem with, um, with uh, allergic reaction because he's just doing it barehanded. And I can say now I'm doing it barehanded as well. Um, it's much better than a lot of clues that you got dirty hands from. After working, you, you wash your hands directly and I've got no problems whatsoever with the epoxy. So that was the ending of the, of the second stage apart that I had to, to cover the inside of the boat as well in the epoxy because epoxy uh, only works on wood if the wood is completely covered in. So the wood has to be dry and if it's dry, you can, you can seal it off both sides. And then the, the, the wood doesn't work anymore because the wood is working when the temperature is, is, uh, is changing. And the, basically the, 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 the moisture in the wood is expanding or shrinking. Now, when the wood is dry and you cover it in on both sides, it can't uh, change anymore. So again, a friend of mine, he was a, a, a a carpenter, a furniture carpenter, and he they had this equipment in uh, in their in their own shop, which is a, a overpressure uh, spraying, and he had the helmet and he was really secured and he sprayed the whole inside of the boat, so we tried to to cover it in as much as we could, and then um, well she's she's finished off with a with a, a, a thick. Uh, coating of epoxy as well. Um, 
So that was the end of the second stage. And then the third, the third stage was finishing her off. Now, finishing her off, um, this was just uh, after the, the, the picture that comes uh, next. But what you can see here, what I changed in the, in, in the original plans of the Galway Hooker, I raised the mast beam. Because the, the first thing that I experienced, and when you want to enter the foxhole in the in, in a Galway Hooker, you have to, to bend really deep because the mast beam in a Galway Hooker is just a, a square between the stringers. And in the Dutch boats, we have got a mast beam underneath the deck. And well, you can hardly see it, but there are huge hanging knees underneath the mast beams that connect it to the frames. Uh, here you can see one. And this is three layers of, of, uh, of oak, which really fills this whole gap between the, the frames there. Um, so for me, I extended, you can see later, I extended the foredeck so I can enter the foredeck just uh, aft of the mast. I can uh, duck down and get into the uh, forecastle. The problem was that um, the, the towards, I had no experience whatsoever about this. And um, in this period from 1990 till 94, um, I traveled up and down Ireland every summer with my car to, to take pictures of, um, of details. And it turned out that I always took the pictures that, of details that I only had uh, uh, figured out. And uh, when I came home, I thought, well, I should have take pictures of this and that as well. And especially the towards, I, I hadn't got a clue how to, to, um, to, to, to manage them. And then luckily, uh, 95 came up. And in 95, the hookers came to Holland. And I don't know if you all are, were uh, there in, in Holland, but uh, this lady here, she is from American... Uh, she's American with Irish roots somewhere, and she had the funny idea to have a Galway hooker built by Johnny to, to uh, charter it. But she was too small to, to even have a pukan. Um, I think she would be drawn through the blocks, but at least she managed to get two of them hookers, the, the Morning Star and the Lady, uh, Lady Moore, to, uh, to come to Holland. And somehow she got the uh, details of my address and she, she called me up and I said, well, I, I'm quite willing to, to uh, do anything, but I'd like to have a specialist on, on, on hookers to uh, overview what I've been doing. So she arranged Johnny to come over and the guy here, that's the funny thing. This is an English guy. I think he was from Manchester, Roy Dixon, and he was restoring a Dutch butter and I was building Galway Hooker. And I remember this whole evening, we had a discussion about boating and, 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 and building and details. And the problem was that he was speaking fluently in English, but he only knew the Dutch phrases of boat building, where I was thinking in Dutch, but since I was reading about boat building in English, I had only the English phrase and we couldn't understand one another at, at all. But anyway, Johnny, came up and, and, and showed me a lot of details about the boats, um, where to take care of. And, and uh, here you can see him making drawings, how I should connect things and, and, uh, and, and so on. And that was in 95. Um, and before the uh, Sail Amsterdam event, when the hookers came over to Holland, there was the Hoth event. And I went up to Hoth uh, and this is in, in, in Hoth, where uh, Joe Murphy came up and I could show him uh, how I progressed with the boat. And he was so, so nice and so kind um, and so supportive. So we had a big discussion there. Johnny was there with the boat. I was sailing with, the, with Johnny on the, on the star there with the whole crew of, uh, of Johnny's. Uh, it was a marvelous weekend, but I wanted to persuade Joe to come to come to Holland as well, because I wanted to have on the project. And I remember that he, he said, well, no, he didn't dare to go. I don't know what, what, what the background of it was, but he, he was reluctant and he wanted, didn't want to go until I managed to 
talked to his wife in host this is on host t and i said well you should come over to amsterdam and she directly said to johnny well to joe i want to go to amsterdam i want to go shopping and i mean joe being a gentleman or be uh, 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 immediately uh, 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 listened to his wife and they decided to come with the whole crew to holland and this is joe and mary and they unfortunately both passed away in amsterdam at the sale event but most of the time joe didn't go to amsterdam but he stayed in my place where i was in amsterdam and he stayed there with my wife and he was she told me afterwards he was just sitting for half an hour and then he went into the shed again with his uh, rulers and, and measurements and he was constantly surveying every detail uh, from the boat at that stage and um, it was a, it was a great fortnight that the boats were there we sailed the same event and later on we sailed on the on the on the isomere to the old cities and we had a party in the back of our garden with uh, with johnny and paul and stefan i think that's patty he was there as well anyway um that was uh, near to the end of the of the project what had to be done was laying the deck i laid the deck of two layers of plywood with a seven mil teak on top of it all glued in with epoxy and you can see here that the foredeck is extended because the hatch is really forward so the mass beam is coming there and there will be a hatch in the back there that I can go in um, without um, uh, too much ado. The other thing that had to be done was another friend of mine. He was so kind to weld a steel uh, uh, strake underneath the keel. And that was frightening because the whole shed was, well, filled with wood and dust. And this guy just laid there and was welding the, the bolts to the keel that were really true true and true we had to lift the whole boat from the the beam underneath and then uh, she was synced in again uh, what else can you see here this is where i had to ask my friend the ship's carpenter to help me out we here we are boring the the shafts for the for the for the prop and that is just about i think a meter and a half of solid oak and we had to come out in the right place. So he measured things out. He made some sort of a slide um, in the right angle. And uh, this is uh, two blocks to have to bore uh, from the drill. And, uh, and he's just sh uh, shifting the, the, the drill up and down. Um, and he came in perfectly in the right, the right spot. I didn't dare to do it because I thought, well, if I misdo this, then the whole project is is done so i was glad to have the help of him but i must say that was the only time that they really had to help me out from, during out the whole project and this this is the same guy um, here we are melting lead in a stainless steel box uh, there is about i think two and a half tons of lead in um, in the boat so that took another weekend to have uh, all the lead dealt with so that was uh, the finishing off and then the whole boat was was ready and um, it was time to launch her well <laughs> that's what i called we had to, to get the bird out of the egg this seems to be an egg so we tore the whole shed out and um, and then she stands there for the first time in 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 full light um, crane passed the house this is our house this here is the workshop. Um, and here you can see the, the mast beam is there, the mast and the hatch. This is a folding hatch that just fits behind the mast beam. And then you can enter there. So first time she hits the water. This is the, the back of the house. So this is the ditch I was talking about. So she had to be in the water. Um, and uh, this is what remains of the shed after the boat was gone. The boat, the, the, the dog was still mooring because he missed the whole scene. But then in this water, the depth of this water is just about, I think 60 centimeters, not more. 
So the boat is drawing 1.4 meters. Well, there was no ballast in, so I think it was 1.2, maybe 1.10, but still way too much to, to get her out. So this is a tugboat from a local uh, guy, and he volunteered to bring me to the other end of the polder. But in between, I want to uh, explain the name of the boat because in the same ditch, in the four and a half years I was building her, these birds were nesting all around. Before I had never seen them in the area, but in these four and a half years, they showed up and they were nesting everywhere. And the, sh the shape of the bird was striking for me to, uh, to the, the Galway hooker with the overhanging stern um, and, uh, and the white belting there. So that's where the name of the moorhen came from. And then I had to get her to the, to the open water. Well, the tugboat took, it, took her out through the polder. This is the tugboat. And here you can see how high the boat was out of the water. But still, this area is just mud that is coming up because she's really dragged through the mud to the other side of the, of the, of the polder. So that was a challenge in itself. And then here we are on the other side of the polder in the back, you can see the village and it's somewhere there that I built it, no, there that I built it the boat. So it had to be drawn all the way up here. And then she was taking out again and she was put in the circular canal. You can see here that was deeper. That's about 1.4 meter. I can say now because I have to trans, I go to the canal with, with the Kinemara as well, and I always hit the ground. So that's 1.4 meters, but that's enough to, to get her uh, um, taken back to the same spot on the other side of the, of the same polder. Then I had to step the mast. Here you can see that there is a lowering mast. Um, this is an area where I can put lead in, oops, sorry, uh, back. I can put lead in as counterweight. This is the, uh, the axis where the, the, the mast is turning. Um, and when I lower the mast with a chain tackle, it's a, a one hand, a one hand job. Um, the, the foot of the mast is coming underneath into the forecastle. You can't move there anymore, but it's just for passing bridges because there are a lot of fixed bridges uh, between the open water and where I, um, wanted to keep her. So that was the final stage before the baptism. This was the day of the baptism. And um, a lot of things had to be prepared in the end. And uh, happily, uh, uh, Stefan was there. Uh, this is Nicola Dixon from the Isle of Man. And this is Stefan. Kieran O'Halloran just be behind the mast came up all the way from, from um, the Isle of Man uh, via Dublin, and he he just was enthusiastic enough to to give me the honor of being there for the baptism. This is the first time that I got the mainsail on in the canal, and I sailed up to a place here next to the house on the other side in the circular canal where the act, act, uh, actual baptism was, and here the grout is guarded, and I have to um, get the thing done. Now, the baptism was happily done. Stefan brought uh, Joe Murphy with him to, uh, to do the actual baptism. And um, maybe I have to be shy. Be um, well, if you baptize a boat, you have to, you, you shouldn't think of, of money. But I thought I want to have a baptize with, a, with a, 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 an Irish whiskey that's more appropriate than, than champagne. And being a Dutchman, I thought, well, it's, it's a waste of whiskey. So I, I take the, the cheapest whiskey that I can get around here. And I didn't know that, <laughs> that this was actually Joe's brand that he liked most. So <laughs> he had to smash a liter of whiskey on the bow of, of, uh, of the Moorhen. And he was really sad. He almost uh, licked the, the foredeck from the remains of the, of the, of the whiskey. 
but it was great. Uh, it, it was a great day, and he, I was really honored that he was there. And this is the, the 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 mayor of our village unveiling the name of the of the the fishery number of the boat, which is an old fishery number from uh, the village that I built the boat in. So it it's an it used to be an official number, and it's obviously uh, abandoned because we are not connected to the sea anymore. And the 42 stands for the four years that I spent working on there with two persons. So that was the baptism. And then I had to thank all my friends, especially Hank Hook, that was the, the man that he helped me out for the whole period. But this whole bunch of people assisted me in some way uh, in the whole project. And um, I can't estimate enough how many people you need to support you on a project like this. You can't do it on your own. Um, and it was a great time. It, it, we had a lot of fun. We had a, a lot of uh, history and um, yeah, it was great. So that was the party in the day. And then afterwards we had the after party where Stefan, um, we had an, a, a friends had a threat treat for me like uh, an Irish, a Dutch band playing uh, Irish folk music. And they, they came up with a, with a song, The Queen of Connemara, but they, they did it in a, in a way that, that Stefan, I think it was a setup, but Stefan couldn't approve of it. So he, they first did their uh, way of uh, playing the, the Queen of Connemara and then Stefan showed, well, this is not the right way. We have to do it differently. And happily, he had his banjo with him. So they played the wrong. Um, and the Queen of Connemara is, for me, is the song that's connected to the Moorhen. Um, so, yeah, that's special. And then, and did she draw attention? Well, this is the local paper of the area. And this says that it's an Irish hooker with two wooden clocks, two Dutch wooden clocks uh, on deck. And that was because I said I wanted to have a boat that I could walk my, with my wooden shoes on. Um, so, yeah, locally there was a lot of attention. You see here the, the pieces of lead as ballast in between, underneath. And this is the, uh, the, the classic boat magazine of Holland, where there, was, uh, there were four uh, big articles about the whole process of, um, uh, of the building. And then I had to sail her out to the open because she was, up till then, she was still in the canal. And to get from my place to the open, I had to pass several canals and a, and a main uh, uh, high road uh, next to Amsterdam. And I was, I remember I was, it was really, uh, it's ridiculous if you think of it, but I was sailing around on the engine through the canals and I had to wait for the bridge to turn um, uh, of this main road. So that took a long time and I, I hooked on on a pole to wait. And there was a, a British boat. I don't know where it was from, it was a yacht. And he was circling around and he didn't dare to fetch the pole. So once I, I got my rope on, he said, can I came, come along and, and, uh, and, uh, and have a wait with you? And he said, well, no, no problem, come along. So we chatted out along and he said, <laughs> this really, I will never forget. He said, in chatting around, he said, um, what I admire most in your in your Dutch traditional craft is the, are the beautiful lines, and I had to say, well, I'm sorry, sir, but this is not a, a Dutch boat; it's an Irish boat. And I saw the the guy draw back. How the hell do I get up with a, an Irish boat in Holland? But it gave me uh, a, an idea of um, that there is a similarity. I know that there are. Uh, people that, that claim there is a Dutch connection from Galway Hooks to Holland, I don't believe it at all. I think it's just a development from, from uh, boating people in the area because she's suited for, for uh, the waters there. But saying that if you look at them, especially the shear line and, and the tumble home is something that we have in Dutch craft as well. So after this guy told me this, and uh, uh, Cormac, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not a, an artist. And I'm not a poet either, but there is a, a small book in Holland with sketches of traditional Dutch crafts with small verses underneath. So 
after this this Englishman told me this, I made this picture for this for my own book with um, with this phrase underneath. The strange in this fleet from uh, from far old Ireland, indeed, my lines are much alike the classic boats behind the dark being the Dutch ones. So um, this is a phrase that I I'd like to have accompanied with the um, with with the boat of the Moran. Um, and then um, in 1999, I brought the boat over to, uh, to Ireland and I did a lot of these festivals. And this is a picture where I was uh, sailing uh, the race in Kinfara and I, I beat it, uh, the couple with just half a bowsprit length. And I remember that uh, Johnny Bailey was at the helm of the couple and, and he, I was catching up with them and he never looked back. He never looked over his shoulder where I was. But the guys that I had as a pilot on my boat, he said, look at them. He's just asking his, his crew, <laughs> where is he? How is he coming? How is he? <laughs> and after the finish, he directly showed up and, and, and uh, congratulated me with the with with achievement. And I was, it was a great, it was a great race. And it was a great year to get involved in people around traditional sailing in, in the Galway Hooker fleet. And as I explained to people, in, in Holland, um, the first four or five years that I visited Ireland, I was a tourist and I, I had to put an effort in, in getting to meet people. But once I was there with the boat, it was like entering a house via the kitchen door. Everyone showed up to me and, and, uh, and uh, wanted to have the details and, 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 um, and the side of the boat. So that, that really got me involved. Um, this is the best prize I have ever won. That was the prize that I, I was handed over at Kinfara weekend. I didn't have to achieve anything for it. The only thing I had to do was show up. And it was a, a, a tribute to, uh, to the Moorhen um, for this tour uh, in 99 when I was there. And it's still here just behind me in my, in my library here. And um, it's a great prize to, uh, to have. And then the next picture, this is, the picture of the true light, as I saw it in Porik Folan's uh, uh, yard. So basically, this is the boat that I rebuilt it uh, in in the in the Moorhen. And um, I hope that uh, that you agree that after seeing this presentation, uh, after watching the presentation, you 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 agree with me that I, well, at least did something more than the true light was in this stage, um, and. Um, I, I must admit, I stole the sterny, which is lying here as well, um, just as a relic from the original. So basically, that was it. I hope I thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, um, well, between the three years that I started sailing and uh, and and uh, and uh, the the end of when I started when I ended sailing the more, and there is well, I, I've grown a bit, so to say. So thank you for listening. That was fantastic, Rick. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. When you were racing in, in, in I remember the year you were over, I didn't remember what year it was. Did you race against the Nave March in at all? Uh, how did you do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I raced the March in, I think in Kinvara. And yeah, I think once once or twice I raced the, the, the March in. And how did you fare out? Did you beat the March in? Did she beat you or was there? Well, I, Paul, you know, I, I'm not really competitive and I was so overwhelmed with all the, the in, impulses that I got there that I really forgot. I, I only can remember that in racing in, in, uh, in the West, um, all the briefings were in Gaelic, so I couldn't understand anything <laughs> at all. <laughs> and I, I remember, I don't know where it was, but one, one of them races, somehow I got in the lead. And I, I thought, well, where the hell do, should I go? And I, when I looked back, I saw them all make a turn for another mark. And I thought, oh, bloody hell, I, I missed the breathing <laughs> again. So I, I wasn't really into, into racing. Yeah, yeah. It was just being there. That was the most important thing for me. But yeah. what I can say is that I, I remember that I was there in, in Galway. That you, I don't know what it's called, but you've got this small fishing harbor next to the locks where you come into Galway. Um, there are some fishing boats lying there and 
and one of the guys said, I, I was lying there just throughout the week and a the, the fisherman came up and, and he said, is this the true light? And I said, well, it's not, but it's based on the lines of the true light. But how do you know? He said, well, the true light was my grandfather's boat and I recognized the lines. He said, well, at least I did some nice job there if you yeah, recognize yeah, the lines. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, those prizes that I can remember, but the outcomes of the races, I mean, the, the, can, the, the more hand was too heavy anyway to, to deal with the, with, with the open hookers. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, well, I remember that year you brought around. Um, I think we did with, with the race and pull bag and then Holt, and then you lift and pull bag and you have trucks down to Connemara. I think I actually drove you down there. Was that the show more? Was that, was that the year the show more was on? The race from Galway City to Karna? Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I think the, 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 we lifted them, were lifted out on trucks. In, yeah, in the yeah, the, the three of them were lifted out on trucks and uh, and were transported to Galway, yeah. That's right, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I think you traveled down to me, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, we first did some tours on the, on the, on, on the East Coast up to... Um, Port of Ferry. Uh, yeah, Port of Ferry, yeah. I remember you in Port of Ferry and you're saying you're not competitive. That's a bare face lie, Rick. No. <laughs> 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 I had to get the best out of you, but that's different with competitive. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah, carry on all work. Did I tell any lies about the family, Arnold? Well, actually, yes. Well, he's most of the story is very Irish, but no lies, so that's disappointing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was really enjoyable. Uh, I think we were with you all the way. Something yeah. similar to around Connemara with uh, Dennis Aylmer when Dennis was looking for to buy a boat. Uh, I, I think the two of you were on the same stream, except you were about 20 years later. But uh, I, we were with you building the boat there, uh, uh, Rick, and uh, the trials and tribulations of wooden boats. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Well, you, you all know that um, afterwards I, I started building the steel one. And... Um, um, later on, I, I, I talked to Daryl that we, we do a presentation about how I transferred the lines into the steel hooker, which is, I mean, my property now. And I'd like to just, uh, we sailed around uh, in the, uh, the, the great, the, the round Britain in 2013, and I visited uh, um, Dublin and, and Belfast. Yeah. So um, that, will, that will be the next story, how, uh, how I dealt with the with the steel, uh, because that's a completely different story. And I, I need the the art master that built the steel hill for me. And he's a big friend of mine now to help me out with details there. So that will come later. Well, right. We have something to look forward to in the winter. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. yeah. How do you find the performance in the steel one and the Moorhan? Uh, the Moorhan is more, more, uh, easy to handle because you can walk around. The difference in, in, in um, the steel one is, is heavier. Um, and um, you, you, you have not that much connection to the water, I would say. Um, I, in, the, in the open boat, I could jump up and down uh, and, and uh, manage all the, the whole boat. And in the in the steel one, I have to do it from the cockpit. So in the in, in the moorhen, I had uh, durational uh, sheetings, uh, and now in the in the Kinemara, I've got uh, winches to uh, to deal with the with the sheets. Otherwise, you, you can't handle them. Okay. But basically, I, I um, um, th they're they're pretty pretty much alike. The only thing it's 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 heavier to. Uh, <laughs> deal with the steel one. Right, right. And what was surprising for me when I saw the, the hookers in the, in the West, that there's so many, so many people on board these boats. And I thought, what the hell? Do I need 10 people to sail a, 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 a 11 meter boat? But it <laughs> turned out that I can do it on my own up till Wind Force 4 or whatever, in, on the inland waters of, of, of Holland anyway. So... Um, yeah, it, it's easy to sail the, the, the moorhead, 
uh, because you, you you can you can get your hands everywhere and, and it's easy to uh, to walk around even with your wooden shoes. Yeah, <laughs> no, I think a lot of the people on the boats in Connemara because they when they're raising they use um, the as little ballast as possible. People, people on board are the ballast, movable ballast. You're told to jump here, jump there, sit there. Yeah, but you have to keep them low, Paul. Yeah, get down. Yeah, yeah. We went out one time on the myself and Tom Quirk, Baldy, what known as Baldy on the um oh the volunteer. And and uh -huh. Joe was on it, Joe McCairns and, and Donald invited us, and uh, there was about six of us on it. But we didn't see any of the race where because we were told to sit down and kick down. <laughs> we seen it, we would have been better off at the pub looking out. We seen nothing. Now we won our class. I think she was a lab one. We won the class, but we seen nothing. Like the odd time I was called up on the deck by Joe to give a hand, pull something, and get back down, stay down. <laughs> so, and bail uh, out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, no, it was an enjoyable day and and probably better crack talk about it afterwards, but that's why there's been so many people. And there was, there was, I wouldn't say there was a ton of ballast in around the day. It was taken out before we went out. And that's why we were, that's why we were avoided. <laughs> so, well, I, I saw them during the race on on the down downwind track throwing all the ballast overboard, and I thought I will never do this with my lead ballast. It's too expensive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Good evening, Rick. Very it's Cahill speaking here in Castlebar, County Mayo. I sent you a text, a wonderful talk. Thank you very much. It was really lovely to hear you and to see all those beautiful photographs. You're welcome. Uh, a real um, uh, endeavor of the heart. Okay. The whole, Thank you. the whole experience. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Hello, James Cahill. Uh, I had thought you were, I had assumed you were a real top class tradesman. Well, no, I'm not. I'm just a. But you are now, that's for sure. I'm an amateur with too much time. <laughs> I'm Barry from Galway. I'm, I'm living in Galway. I'm just across the way from Kinbara, and I've been there many times. It was nice to see you there. The first photograph you showed of that boat hard heeled over, that was the Hunter. Did you know that? Well, and it according to the book, it's, it's Martin the Lord. Jennings. Hmm? Okay. Was it from Pat Jennings? Yes, Martin uh -huh. Jennings whom I am in contact with at the moment okay. because I'm involved with the Baldory in Galway. Yeah. And yeah. We, have a, we have a number of hookers here that we're looking after and a couple more being restored. And we also have, I saw Kieran Oliver spoke to you earlier and they have the Galway Hooker Club and they are working on a number of boats as well. So the boats are all being brought back. But one thing I would like I'd, to I'd say- I'd like to have uh, more contact with them, Barry. The one thing I would like to say is about the True Light. I knew and met the original owner of the True Light when I started sailing in Galway. Martin Oliver was his name. Yeah. And um, other thing I'd like to comment, the lovely photographs that you showed at the beginning, you showed two Pukon. We don't see many of them now. That's the boat with the Latin sail. Oh, yeah. yeah. So nice to see them, you know. Because you, as you know, you have the poke on, you have the glow chug on which I learned to sail. And you talked about being in Galway docks, looking in the, in the small dock, looking at a hooker there. And I think you were looking at them at the Regina Chaley, which was a boat on which I learned to sail. It belonged to a man called Michael Casey. Okay, was it Michael Casey? Yes, and uh, I really enjoyed your talk. And beautiful. just tell me, how, what length is your boat, the boat you built? Well, officially they claim it's 35 feet, but mm -hmm. I was confused by the measurements um, because I understood that the, the measurements were taken from the inside of the stem and stern post, okay. which for me is amazing. So oh. I, I really don't know anymore. I see. It's a beautiful boat, but well done. What a beautiful construction. But uh, I'm very, I, I'd like to be in. I'd like to be in contact with the with the with the team in in Galway about uh, uh, yeah. restoration because next time yeah, I well, definitely. If you, ever, if you ever do come to Galway, look us up. You, you'll find us easily. We're easy to find. Yeah, but We're easy to find. Okay. Rick, Rick, um, <laughs> Peter Connolly from the Badari. Well, obviously, they, they, this, we, we gave them the, the, the RS Cronon, handed over the Nave Cronon to them, is a member of the OGA now. 
Okay. Right, well, so I'm a member of the board already, and I'm I know Peter, and we talk every day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I just uh, take this opportunity before I really drifts off to say once again, mm -hmm. thank you very much, Rick, for a very entertaining yeah. and informative evening, and well done. Yeah, uh, uh, Rick, where is she now? Who who has more hen now? Now you're She's in my backyard. <laughs> oh, do, do you still yes. have her? No, I don't. I, oh, I don't know if if um, if that's okay to to uh, to mention. But she's um, she's coming back to Ireland. Have you a record of what it cost you to build? No, In, no. including the shed and all the rest. Or would you? Well, I can say that that um, at one point I thought, well, the freight, the the the. the the calculation of this friend of friend of mine was pretty accurate. That uh, it, it would probably cost me the same amount uh, as the bare hull of a steel hooker, right? Which is just about, I think. Uh, well, I, I know I really can't say, Paul, because I, I mean, for instance, the engine was a, a gift from a friend of mine that abandoned his car, and he said, yeah. "You can get my Volkswagen engine." So I, I transferred it into a marine uh, uh, kit. So there, there are so many things that are gifted that I, I can't say. Yes, yes, yes. And, and the, wood, the wood, I mean, charging, going after the, the timber is, is, uh, is, is a sport in itself if you do a project like this. If you really go through the timber yard, it will cost you a fortune. But yeah. then there are people that say, well, I, I know a forester here that has got an oak tree down and you can probably get it cheap uh one of the biggest problems was to get it a sawmill that could uh, saw the, the the full length of the of the the trees because they they're used to have a five five point two meter max and i wanted to have a, a seven seven and a half meter uh a tree sawn yeah so, are all your planks full length no, 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 no. Oh, okay, well, you sound no, that would be eleven or twelve. No, you can't put a value on the like. You cannot put a value on the pleasure you get from a boat. Like it, you, you can't compare it from what it costs you to the sell it. Right? It's an endless. It's it's you're throwing money at it all the time. But how do you put a value on the pleasure you get from it? You can't. You know what I mean? So it's right. it's 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 a whale scam. Whale. Well, well, whale. Paul, you have been in, in, in the project with the, with the Crown and yourself. I mean, the, the, the period, the time you spend uh, every, every uh, week getting uh, something fixed. I remember this, uh, this friend of mine I worked with being a GP. I remember him saying when we, when we were planking her in from, from the bottom up, you get this, this rounded form. And all of a sudden he said... Uh, <laughs> This is the belly of a, a three months pregnant lady. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, only a GP can come up with something like that. No but yeah. I mean, yeah. only that yeah. phrase is so valuable in, in, in the whole period that you're building this. this, uh, yeah. this. And, and like, even the sailing of it, um, right, to be the Cronom was special. Now, I wasn't there for a lot of the building of it, but it was built by a club and a community I was involved in, and I we sailed there for 23 years, I think she was afloat, and to be able to go into a harbour and people say, where is she, or who is she built by, and you say, it was built by us, and this, that, and the other. Like, the value of that alone was yeah, spectacular. Yeah. And then, I think the finishing story, which kind of topped it up me, they said that the two happiest days in life was when you buy a boat and sell a boat. <laughs> It was heartbreaking for the Cronin to go, but the Lodge went to Galway with a value of, I think it was 120,000 rebuilding value and was handed over 100 euro, which was given to the lifeboat. Um, it was a fantastic end to that project, for me anyway. You know what I mean? But but you, you cannot put a value on, on the pleasure you get from the boat, the sailing of the boat and all that. It's, 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 it's unreal. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree there. Yeah. 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 So I'm, I'm I sure. Think, I think leaving aside the uh, material that you put into a uh, building or rebuilding or restoring a boat, there's no way you could put value on that time, labor, hardship, and uh, to, I think you must take it as you're never going to recover that. Even if you build a boat to sell it, you'll ne you'll never uh, recover the time that you've put into it. Not that you would want to or put a value on it. Yeah. 
because well, if, uh, if, you it's... Don't, if you don't like uh, working on boats, you, you shouldn't go for for any traditional boats, let alone a wooden one. Yeah, and yeah. Daryl, you 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 probably know best if I hear the stories about your blocks and your varnishing and your painting. I mean, it's an endless job, and as long as you enjoy it, that's I mean yeah. just a way to spend your time. Otherwise, you sit in the pub, which is nice as well, uh, or you go to a sports club, which is not nice at all. So uh, two days ago, we had a national holiday here, and it was beautiful weather, and I had to be in the garden for the whole day. And I said, "Well, I want to go to the bloody boat." let's go this, yeah. this long yeah. done and i can yeah. go well i mean yeah i mean if that's not the pleasure you have don't start voting that's the whole thing yeah that's, yeah 100 percent. 100 percent. and here we have the nave cronon the manuela and the cree on cladi and they were all moored out in the cladder basin in galway for christmas and they were all decorated with Christmas lights. They swans on the deck. Yes, they were. Lit, they were Christmas swans. They were lit <laughs> up with, with fairy <laughs> lights. They're dummies, yes. Jimmy. They're dummies. Well, I, I, I must say that um, this whole uh, trip in '99 that we spent, uh, I think I spent 10, 10, 12 weeks in in Ireland. Uh, it was such a privilege to to get all these traditional people around the Galway Hoopers to learn them and, and to talk to them. Uh, it, it really got me involved, in my opinion, anyway. So, yeah, that was great. Rick, could I ask you something? Has your project excited any interest among any other enthusiasts in Holland at all? Has anybody else intimated that they might like to uh, try a similar project? Uh, on on Galway Hoopers, you mean? Galway? Yeah. Well, I, I can say she she attracts a lot of attention uh, around here, um, and um, the 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 Dutch fleet is um, is separated now in people that do leisure and people that do racing, and the racing uh, traditional racing boats um, are a class in itself, and it's absolutely ridiculous what they are doing there. And you, you, you're not part of the of the team if you haven't got a boat. And mind you, they, they are. I saw some of they that. Uh, like, they will cost like 400,000 euros. Yeah, I saw some of that. They take no prisoners in those races. <laughs> with the big scotchies. <laughs> but I mean, she definitely, wherever she comes, a lot of people recognize the, the, the Galway hooker. Um, some because they know the book of Dick Scott, some because they have been traveling in the West, and some because they have read the articles that uh, were published in the traditional boat uh, uh, magazine in Holland. But she definitely uh, gets a lot of attention when she enters from... Uh, uh, what is special as well, that we've got a chartering fleet in Holland with big barges from, I think there will be about 300 of them around. And every time you sail with a, with a, with a hooker on the ice on me and, and a big barge is passing by, you see the, the skipper turning his head what's sailing there because the, the rigging is so distinctive. They they recognize it's something different from what they're used to. Again, Rick, another question, and I may have asked this before, but for other people, so you always, on, on both your boats, carried white sails. Yeah. Rather than the traditional town sails. Yeah. Oh, why? <laughs> <laughs> Because that's what the sailmaker hands me out. I mean, I remember that this my first sailmaker. Um, he said, "I he said I got a client, and he said uh, I I want to have a I I want to have a, a, a white sails cheaper because you don't have to color them brown." Okay. <laughs> <laughs> But, I mean, uh, the, the whole thing is you, you to find a proper cloth. You're you're dedicated to the uh, sailmaker because he's the only one that can estimate the quality of uh, of the cloth, and he he doesn't he doesn't give you any guarantee on on his product if he hasn't uh, chosen yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. material. And uh, um, basically, I thought white sails were looking good on, on this boat. It was only later on that, that I understood that having wide sails in the fleet of Galway hookers 
made you some sort of the leader of the fleet, which was quite <laughs> embarrassing when I was sailing around there. But I mean, I had an excuse. I was a stupid Dutchman. I didn't know at all. <laughs> Rick, I must say that your sails set much better than the Cronon on Paul Jones. <laughs> well, he battles at every race, so I, I, I expect so. If I'm not mistaken, the, 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 the was it a king of the clatter? could fly white sails. I think his boat, the boat was called the Swan. Um, uh, I'm not, I'm not 100 sure on that. Um, but I think the the the, the member was the Swan. He flew the King of the Clad. He was known as. He could fly white sails, only. So yeah. I don't know, but you're obviously King of Hobbits. So we, we accept that. <laughs> you're right, Paul. The King of the Clad could could have white sails. Yeah. Was it? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Was he was he elected every year? Uh, no, it was a kind of traditional, um, you know, old Irish kingship sort of thing, you know. Uh, yeah. uh, I think it passed down through families mainly. I'm not so sure about the cladder now, how, how that worked. How are you doing? I just I, I just shed a bit of light on that. Yeah. How are you, Kieran? How, how are you doing? I'm, a, I'm a, I don't know what you call me, a descendant of a king anyway, but Martin and Paddy Oliver uh, were both the great granduncle and great grandfather of myself. And these uh, two lads uh, owned the original True Life, built in 1922. And Martin, after the Cleggan disaster, uh, later went on to be elected the King of the Clada. And like I said about the the, uh, the white sails, yeah, it was a local election. The local, he was the admiral of the fleet, I suppose, you know, they, they would have. But Martin was, uh, at, that, at that stage, like the, the tradition of King was, I suppose, Maybe it was phasing out. Maybe it was an, it was a nominal figure. Do you know what I mean? And, and the king was yeah. kind of ruled the roost in the old clad in the cottages, and he was the man with the white sails and and started the fishing season and finished the fishing season, and among other things, I suppose. You know, yeah, yeah. But then, in Holland, people uh, traditionally had a, a, a white cotton sails, and only when they sails were worn out a bit. They were tanned and they were turned into brown. So in Holland, if you had got brown sails, it was a preservation, but only after the first or the second season when the when the sails were sailed out a bit. But that's obviously different in in in, in the clatter. Hmm. Uh, I, can, I I well I do know that the the well, the that's traditional sail cart using hoopers now the name is tanned or tan bark, and barking of the sails was a common thing as well to preserve the sails. Yeah. So may, possibly maybe the the king was a bit, it was wealthier than most maybe, and, and he had white sails to begin with maybe. And then as yeah. these were passed down to other people, who yeah. knows, you know, yeah. we have a couple of, yeah, yeah. So there's, there's many versions of these stories, but like, should we, we've, uh, should we know we have black sails and yeah. maroon sails and tan bark sails and yeah. who knows, we might have white sails against something. Uh, um, was, was his boat called a swan? No, no, the, the true life, the one that uh, Rick life, mentioned there. Life, the, the, true life, okay. So I yeah. tied white sails, yeah, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Mart Martin was the last uh, uh, last man to sail a working Galway hooker when he sold it to uh, the poet Richard Murphy in 1963. So our family had it for 42 years or so. And was she built for the family? Yes, yeah. She was built on the site of Galway City Museum uh, where uh, John Francis Rainey, uh, John Francis Rainey had a boat chair there. And if you if you if you fancy googling there for a bit of history, there's there is a uh, there's a there's a Galway hooker in the museum as an exhibition, and it was it was decided to name it the Martin or the Martin Oliver after Martin. Oh, he was built by Michael McDonough and, and uh, Pat Fallon, is that correct? Is yeah, that that's one? yeah, yeah. She was built about fourteen or fifteen years ago, I think, uh, by uh, just before the museum was opened. And, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Kieran, you, you know Richard Murphy wrote a poem about uh, the true light. Yeah. Yeah, the last call the hooker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, I do yeah. yeah. I, yeah. I don't know was it that one actually that he. I know it probably it provided some inspiration, but yeah, I know, I know, you know. Yeah, you know the poem. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Sir. And do you know who owned the uh, the true light when when uh, Joe Murphy wanted to take the lines down in in Baltimore or whatever? Uh, I'm not 100% sure. I know that, uh, well, I did hear that it went to Glen Anne's and stuff, and maybe, you know, there was a few owners after that, so I, 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 don't, uh, I don't fully know from, uh, you know, after, after uh, Richard Murphy. I know the Okulons and the guys that, the, the, the guys that 
bought it in the 90s or 99 or that, you know, and, and had it rebuilt or restored or whatever. But, uh, yeah, the bits in between are kind of... Uh, to, to just don't don't have a full kind of record on that, but yeah, yeah. Um, like it was, she was in Baltimore. That's where the lands the lands had a base down there. So that's possibly a thing. I t I know Dominic Hunt, Mick Hunt's brother. He he owned her. He he had her with a, a vision to restore, and she was in um, Park Fold and O'Coolon's yard for a long time. That's where you you've probably seen her. Rick and um and they they own her now. Well, they 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 rebuilt her and, and have her sailing now. Well, they they didn't rebuild the true light. They built a new boat. Then they named the true light. It was a completely different boat. <laughs> I'm glad I'm glad, glad you said that. Not me, but actually, sure look, yeah, that's uh, true. But you sure look, sure yeah. it is what it is. You know, uh, exactly. couple of nails maybe, <laughs> <laughs> couple of bits here and there. Right. So, Rick, uh, great job. Thank you very much, and a great discussion afterwards. With that, I'll say good night to everybody and um, thank you once again. Thank you, John. Thank you. God thank bless. You. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Rick. Thanks very much indeed. Okay.